Hello and welcome back to our study of the Dhammapada. Today we continue on with verse number 90, which reads as follows. Kattadhino visokasa vipamutasa sabbadi sabbagandha pahinasa parilaho navijati which means Gatadino, one who has com for one who has completed their journey, completed the going. Visokasa, one who is free from sorrow. Vipamutasa sabadi, one who is liberated everywhere. Who is everywhere free, everywhere they go. Sabagantha Pahinasa, one who has abandoned all fetters, all forms of clinging, every object of attachment. Parilaho Navijati, no fever can be found, no uh, distress. Distress is probably the best translation. Parilaha. Katadinovi Sokasa. Very beautiful little verse. Uh, it talks about the fever. Parilaha is, is often translated as fever. That's uh, probably etymologically fairly correct. Burning, right? But uh, in, in this specific instance, because of the story and, and because of the, uh, the context of the verse itself, it's not a fever, it's a mental fever, a mental burning. So we would translate it as distress or fever of passion. But literally it means burning, I think. Daha. Paridaha becomes parilaha. So the story, this was told in regards to a question posed by Jivaka, who was a doctor. And the doctor who looked after the Buddha, and his story is not told here. I'm not can't remember if it's actually told in the in the um, in the Dhammapada. I don't think so. Maybe in the Jataka it occurs, but in the Vinaya definitely you find his story. Um, he was a master doctor, an, an exceptional uh, medicine man. They say that. Uh, and the final task given to him by his teacher was to uh, with it was to stake out a 16 kilometer by 16 kilometer square piece of land which is a league a square league yojana of land and bring to his teacher every plant in the entire square league that had no medicinal properties. And this was the task. So he set out to accomplish this task, came back sometime later and said to the teacher, I, there are no such plants. There are no plants in that 16. I couldn't find any plants that were without medicinal properties. And that's how his teacher knew that he passed, because he... He was able to identify medicinal properties in all plants. That's the story. So he was exceptional. He got, um, he caused a little bit of trouble, or he got into a little bit of trouble, not of his own, not on his own. He was actually an awesome, wonderful person. He donated a, a, a mango grove to the Buddha. And you can still go and see the place that's supposed to be this, where this mango grove was, right at the bottom of Vulture's Peak, because uh, Vulture's Peak was difficult to go up constantly to take care of the Buddha, so in order to make it easier for him to take care of the Buddha when the Buddha was sick, he would, uh, he, and also to make it easier for the Buddha to go on alms round when the Buddha was ill, he gave him this mango grove at the bottom of the hill, the bottom of the mountain. Um, but 
as he was looking after the Buddha, he also took on the role of looking after the monks. And uh, as a result of taking, paying so much attention, taking so much time to look after the Sangha, his other patients started to miss him. And so people who were sick would actually ordain as monks uh, just just to try and get the, this um, this level of care, and this was actually the reason why the Buddha instated the rule that someone who is sick, someone who has this sickness, has these, has any any uh, terrible sickness, sh shouldn't be allowed to ordain. I mean, there are, there are other reasons for it. Obviously, it's problematic, but. It's one of those things that leads people to ordain for the wrong reasons, and it, this happens in Buddhist countries where they become lax about this, and uh, it really be these people become a burden on the monastic sangha rather than actually uh, promoting Buddhism and doing good things. So, lots of, uh, there's a few stories about him, but this story actually concerns Devadatta in tangentially. Because the story goes that um, Devadatta was trying all sorts of ways to kill the Buddha. Devadatta was the Buddha's cousin and he got upset and jealous of the Buddha and he wanted to be the leader of the Sangha. Just kind of an all-around mean and nasty sort of fellow. And so he tried, he sent a, 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 an elephant after the Buddha and the elephant, the Buddha tamed the elephant. It was this mad elephant that was supposed to trample the Buddha, and the Buddha tamed him with loving kindness. Uh, he sent some archers after the Buddha, some some mercenaries after the Buddha, and they all converted to become monks. And uh, finally, he just got fed up, and as the Buddha was coming down from Vulture's Peak, he dropped a, a rock, a big boulder on the Buddha, trying to crush him. From, from up on high. And as the rock was falling down, it hit a, a uh, some sort of outcropping, of course, because you can't kill the Buddha. It just doesn't happen. His karma is too good. And, but a little splinter, a small splinter, uh, broke off. The, the rest of the rock veered out of the way and didn't come close to the Buddha, but a small splinter came and hit the Buddha's foot. And Jivaka looked after the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha lay down and Jivaka bandaged him up or um, put some poultice on the wound. I think the commentaries try to say that he didn't actually bleed because it's impossible to make the Buddha bleed, but it's about the translation as to what exactly is meant to happen anyway. Whatever, the Buddha was injured and the, uh, he was he put some, some her herbs on it, some something strong that would take the pain away and make the swelling go down, but it was quite strong. And then Jivaka had to go into the city to look after his patients in the city. And he was late, he was looking after some rich person or maybe even the king, and he was late coming back and they, they closed the gates to the city before he could get out. And so he had to stay all night in the city and he was worried all night and, and um, concerned because he had to go back and take this poultice off off of the Buddha's ankle, uh, or else it would cause harm. It would actually cause harm to the Buddha, and so he was um, unable to let the Buddha know. Fortunately, that's what that's the benefit of having all sorts of you know, supernatural powers. The Buddha was able to discern that it was time to take the the poultice off, and took it and had Ananda help him take it off and uh, waited there for Jivaka to come. So no harm done. But harm was done to Jivaka, who was worrying and fretting, who was distressed. Uh, now Jivaka was actually a Sotapanna. I think at this time he was already a Sotapanna, though I'm not sure of the actual timeline. I'd have to look deeper into that. But I think he was already a Sotapanna at this point. So he was already an, uh, an Arya Bugala, but he was still subject to distress, and so he, he fretted about this for the long time, that he was uh, kept in the city, and finally when the gates opened in the morning, he ran over, ran, sprinted his way over to Vulture's Peak. 
and came to the Buddha and asked him, I'm sorry, Venerable Sir, uh, that I wasn't able to come. Were you distressed by the pain? Were you distressed by your illness? And that's where this verse comes from. Jivaka asked him this simple question. And the Buddha said, For one who has gone to the end, who is free from sorrow, one who is free everywhere, Gone to lib who has become liberated everywhere, who has abandoned all ties. Parilaho Namijati. There is no fever to be found, no distress to be found. The word fever is, is too ambiguous, but one well, never becomes distressed. So, this was, um, I think last night we had the question whether an arahant can suffer, be, whether it can actually be called suffering when an arahant feels pain because they don't have and this is what they don't have the translation that we've got in the book actually says it translates parilaha as suffering but that's probably not um, not accurate it's again too ambiguous too too general the, the specific meaning is a is a burning up so it's often referring to the body but here it means burning up in the mind were you distressed? Did it distress you? Upset? Did it upset you? Were you upset by it? Were you distressed by it? Were you vexed by it? And the Buddha said there is no vexation for one who has become free. And so that's the answer to that question, that they, they do actually feel dukkha vedana in the body, but they're not vexed by it. A very important point that all of us as meditators hopefully by this time have, have heard or have come to be familiar with. But it's a point that has to be made especially for people who are new to the meditation. The difference between uh, not only physical suffering but external conditions like the state of, of Jivaka who was stuck in the city was incredibly vexed and disturbed and distressed. But, you know, he had a good heart. But he wasn't helping the Buddha by being vexed and distressed, by being upset. And in fact, he was simply doing damage to his own mind. And so it, to, to some extent, uh, the Buddha was, was using this as a lesson to Jivaka as well, not only to reassure him, but also to remind him not to get upset. I wasn't upset. Why did you get upset? Uh, and so this is because of the difference between the physical, the, the external, and our reactions. Pain doesn't have to be a bad thing. Excruciating pain doesn't have to be a bad thing. Situations don't have to cause us anger and frustration and upset or boredom or worry or fear. Ang you know, when people do things to us, when others hurt us, we do the worst thing when we re when we respond with anger. When someone gets angry at us and we respond with anger, we're the worst. We we're the we are doing we are creating the worst evil. Buddha said. But this is a clear indication of the difference between our experiences and our reactions to them. So what do we have? One who has gone to the end means... Actually, I don't know, gat adino. It's translated as one who has gone to the end of the journey. Yeah, well, that's what they say here, but let's see exactly what it means. Adin. One who has... Right. One who has gone the, gone the distance. So who has completed the path. I think at meditators asking how you know how far you're progressing, and it's all this idea of the path and... I'm often cynical about whether we should really focus too much on the idea of a path. It's it's misleading, I think. You know, I think it's um, fine to talk about the idea of a path, but when we are concerned about our progress, it can become quite obsessive, as we're worried about where we are, wondering when we're going to get there, that kind of thing. On the other hand, having the idea of the path is a is a 
is a reminder that we can't be complacent, that we do have to walk and journey. But it's important as a teacher and, and, and as a meditator to not be too focused on progress. So this idea of the path or the journey, it's poetic and it's useful to know that there is a journey. But when you're walking a journey, you don't want to be the person in the back seat saying, are we there yet, are we there yet, right? That, that part of the mind should be silenced. The walking has to continue. All you have to do is put one foot in front of the other. You know that there's a path and you follow it. It's much simpler than we think. We think of it as being some kind of um, like a, a, a paved road with road signs telling you 10 kilometers left or something like that, but it's not really. It's a path we've never gone and a path that has no clear signs that we can distinguish because we've never, you know, we have nothing no frame of reference. So our job is, yes, to follow the path, but that simply means putting one foot in front of the other, metaphorically speaking. We sokasa, so an enlightened being has no soka, no sadness, no sorrow. They don't long for anything, they don't uh, pine away at loss. They don't worry about lo about losing the things that they have. No soka, no sadness. Vipamutasa sabadi, in all directions, on all sides, everywhere. Vipamutta, uh, freed, liberated. Completely liberated. Sabaganta pahinasa, having abandoned or destroyed or gotten rid of all um, binds or ties severed all ties some people talk a lot about det uh, detachment how Buddhism um, is a clear indication of how Buddhism does uh, encourage uh, the, the idea of detachment but people get the wrong idea that it, it somehow translates into a sense of, of or a state of, of zombie-like nothingness or meaninglessness. All it means is to not cling to things as they go by, because the problem is we have this idea that things exist uh, constantly or in some stable form, and so we're talking about shying away from them, that, we, that people think non-attachment means it's there, don't go near it. But that's not it. It's not there, actually. What is there is a moment, and that arises and ceases. That's fine. Be as close and as clearly aware of that as you can be. That's the, the point. But when it's gone, don't go with it, you know. Don't let it pull you into the past. Don't let thoughts about the future pull you into the future. You end up like this, pulling, being pulled to both sides, past and future. And you're never really here and now. That's what non-attachment means. It's, it, it would make sense if there were things here that were stable to attach to them, because you could depend upon them, right? But there's nothing like that. Nothing is, like, is of that sort. Everything arises and ceases, comes and goes, is uncertain. Even all the possessions that we have, that, they think, that we think we have constantly throughout our lives, the people who are with us, the reason we're so sad is because we take them as some stable entity that can be controlled and that is uh, long-lasting and so on. And so we bind ourselves to them with this attachment. You know, Non-attachment or detachment. Non-attachment is a better way of phrasing it. Non-attachment means experiencing, but experiencing as experience, seeing people as individual experiences, seeing things as individual experiences, because that's what they are. That's what you really have. How can you say you have a car when you don't see it, when you don't hear it, you know, when you're not in front of it, when it's not in front of you? How can you say that you even have people in your life when they're not here and now? All you have is a thought that arises and ceases, even when they're with you. All you have is seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, feeling, and thinking. 
So non-attachment just means seeing things as they are and being with things. So being with, if there's people around you, there's people around you. If there's no one around you, there's no one around you. It's not pining away after something that isn't there or clinging to something that is. For such a person who is of this sort, there is no fever. So what it means is they have no likes or dislikes. They have no vexation and no upset when things don't go as expected because they have no expectations. They're perfectly at peace and perfectly flexible. I think flexible is a very important aspect. Just naturally flexible because they have no preference. They are content the way things are, however they are. So, that's the Dhammapada for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in. And uh, keep practicing. And be well. <laughs>